Hello, my name is Tim Paradis. I'm the host of an occasional interview series at the Portland Media Center on topics of political and social interest to Mainers. I'll be talking today to Larry Gilbert, who is a former mayor and police chief of the city of Lewiston. Uh, also has a long time and passionate interest in the Palestinian people. This interview is a follow-up to a conversation I had recently with Bob Scheibel, the chair of Maine Voices for Palestinian Rights, in which we focused on the, the police training exchange between Israel and the United States. So we'll be combining a, a number of topics here. Larry, could you start by telling me how you became uh, police chief, the evolution of your career briefly, and your interest in the Palestinian people? Well, I started in 1969 and uh, uh, as a patrol officer, I worked my way up through the ranks to chief of police. Then I was the U.S. Marshal for the District of Maine uh, for eight years, five years at the Maine Community Policing Institute, and then five years as mayor of Lewiston. So, uh, and I became, uh, uh, I guess, uh, interested in the, the plight of the Palestinian people. And uh, we now winter in Florida, and in Florida, I belong to an organization called World Beyond War. And I'm a Vietnam veteran, so I, uh, I am also a member of Veterans for Peace. And a lady uh, in World Beyond War had an interest in the Palestinian issue. And I, I consider myself a, per, a people person, and I, uh, I, I, saw the, I could see the plight of the Palestinian people. So I met with her and got more information and then became uh, more involved in the issue and uh, doing a lot of uh, research and so on uh, to see what is really happening there that we don't see here uh, through the corporate media here in the United States. And how do you stay informed about uh, issues related to Israel and Palestine? Well, I subscribe to uh, uh, the, the Times of Israel, uh, for one mm. of them, uh, and uh, uh, World Beyond War, uh, and also Veterans for Peace. Uh, they've had uh, members go to Palestine and see what is actually happening there, where uh, the Palestinians uh, are oppressed uh, in, in the Gaza Strip and in uh, the West Bank. So um, they're caught there and are, are policed there by the government. So Let's talk about your experiences, uh, police chief in Lewiston. Lewiston is a demographically and has increasingly become a culturally and racially diverse city. When you were police chief, uh, were there issues in community relations and the type of policing that you inherited that you needed to address? Can you speak to that? Well, no, uh, actually, uh, I brought community-oriented policing to Maine in 1990 uh, when I was police chief, and uh, we, uh, trained of all, it's a philosophy, not a program. And we trained all of our officers in the SARA problem solving model, scanning, analysis, response, and uh, uh, analysis. Yeah. So, um, and we trained all of our officers in that. We placed uh, our officers on bicycles. We were the first department in mm -hmm. Maine to have bicycles. And we had a lawyer, uh, I mean, uh, a landlord uh, on the street with the highest number of calls for service. And he gave us an apartment to have our officers work out of there, right there in the community. So we were able to re reduce our crime rate. And uh, so it, it, it's a, a department of service to people. That's what I wanted as a police chief. And obviously with the uh, protests nationwide following the uh, killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, the perception among the public and the reality, I think, in most cities is that model of policing is not the norm. Um, can you speak to uh, some of the issues that you perceive about policing in the U.S.? And yeah. I will also add, because we are trying to cover two topics here, the relation of the police right. to training from Israel, 
Um, whether you have encountered that mindset and whether you've encountered that e training exchange between Israel and the U.S. in your experience. But if you can speak to police culture in general. Yeah, well, my, my encounter with it is, is not positive, you know. It's, uh, it's, it's so militarized that uh, even starting at a police academy uh, where it is a paramilitary type of training, where uh, it's sort of like uh, entering the basic training for the military. And you're talking about the basic training in U.S. In the U.S. Police. here. Yes. And uh, so where you have to bounce a quarter on a bed and you have to have inspection and you have to, you can't talk during the meals and all of that. I went to the police academy in 1970 and it was nine to five. It was a college type atmosphere. And uh, I think I turned out all right. So... Uh, I think that training for police should be like, we want them to be professionals. How do we train other professionals? You can still do all of the force type things, but treat them like you would a, a professional in, in any other profession. So I think it starts there. And I think it starts even before that. It starts with recruiting how you recruit. You can recruit for the spirit of, of uh, adventure, and that really attracts people, or in the spirit of service. But if you recruit in the spirit of adventure, you're going to get that. It's much more difficult to tr train that person to be of service versus one of service to learn all of the, the use of guns, the use of force, right. and all of that stuff. So. Uh, because you're a service organization, you're there to serve people. When we talk about protect and serve, serve is a key word there. So now to look at uh, training for uh, police, U.S. police in Israel, and Israeli police training our officers here, Israeli police there are an occupying force, people, people, keeping people oppressed, and, uh, and uh, use, use of force against them, uh, imprisonment, torture. Uh, so, you know, is that what we want here? And we spend uh, $7,000 an hour uh, to the military, to the uh, Israeli government. And so in terms of, uh, of uh, our dollars, our tax US dollars. U.S. government funding that goes to Israel. Right. And so, you know, the problem here I see is that the corporate media doesn't show that side of the issue between the Israeli and Palestinians. When you say and that side, you mean it's focused on focused Israeli security and Israeli needs and never the Palestinian right. and, story. And, and the Palestinians are being made to, to be uh, terrorists and, and are, are treated as such when they are not. Uh, the... Palestinian people are just ordinary family people who want to live as they used to live before, uh, before uh, it was created a, as a state of Israel. So, uh, you know, that's all they want is just, you know, to be able to live like we do here, uh, raise your family and uh, live, you know, in peace instead of in fear, constant fear, constant fear of the police. And so, and I kind of see that happening here, and I don't like it. Um, you know, yeah. we see our, uh, our police being more militarized with uniforms and, uh, you know, uh, you know there's, there's so much body armor and this and that. It's a fear factor as well. And police shouldn't be there to put fear in people. They're there well, to I, serve. I can <laughs> tell you that as someone who's been to dozens if not hundreds of protests and demonstrations over the years. I look at the rows of police in their Kevlar vests and helmets and I've always asked myself, are they here to protect my right as an American citizen to express dissent or to mm -hmm. express free speech? Or are they here to make sure that, you know, I don't step out of line or that, that they enforce the, the will of the state? Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the political and cultural 
uh, determinants of what's been happening increasingly in the U.S., what do you think those, those forces are and how much um, chance do you, do you give our society to change the model of policing that we currently have? Well, since it's an issue now, and it seems to be an ongoing issue, and, and it's, it's, it's been placed in the forefront. And so now, as a result, people don't just want to, you know, they've heard reform, reform, and, and then it goes back to the same thing. I think now the issue is right there on the, the front burner, and people are demanding change. And for example, here in Maine, uh, Mike Soschuk, the former Portland police right. chief and, uh, and uh, public safety commissioner, uh, I, I contacted him last week and he sent me uh, some reports that the uh, Police Academy Board of Trustees have gone through and has been signed off by the Maine Chiefs of Police Association, the Maine Sheriff's Association, and the Maine Department of Public Safety. And... Uh, they reviewed all of their policies, and uh, so and they're going to do, do periodic reviews as well. And they've uh, they've made some changes, and this has been since uh, what we've seen here uh, this year with right. the protests. So I'm glad to see that, and um, I think Mike Soschuk uh, really cares greatly. I think he was a great police chief here in Portland, and. Uh, so I'm glad to see him, that Governor Mills appointed him as uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety. So I feel good about Maine. I don't feel so good about Florida. And can you speak to your perception of Florida or some of the na sort of national uh, trends or Well, situations? national, the trend, and the, the trend can happen here, too, because we get military equipment. And some of it can be helpful. For example, to bring uh, officers in a, an armored personnel carrier uh, in a barricaded subject uh, situation or whatever. But some of this equipment is just so huge and so on. And, uh, and so when you dress like that and you feel like right, that, well, right. well, who's the enemy? So, you know, we, I think we've got to draw back from that. So I think, for example, uniforms, uh, I think we need to soften the image of police officers. Everything is uh, sort of uh, is paramilitary. We have military type uniforms. We have ranks, you know, corporal, sergeant, lieutenant, captain. Uh, we don't have that with uh, other, uh, other other professions. professions. Right. And so we can call them supervisors or whatever. But, uh, and the uniform, I think soften the uniform. For example, uh, when we had the bicycle patrol, I had uh, uh, officers in, in a certain bicycle uniform, which right. was nice, and it was softer. Polo shirts, slacks like this, um, I think softens the image, and I think it becomes, uh, people become more, uh, the officers are more approachable to the public. And I think we need that coming together. And those kinds of changes, it sounds like, would be made at the municipal police level or at the state level, perhaps, in terms of policies. And can you speak to uh, national level changes that might need to be made? Because I know there is the issue of qualified, I think it's called qualified immunity, yeah. where uh, the police are given pretty much the, the almost extreme well, yeah, because, benefit of the doubt in any situation. Because police face situations that the normal uh, individual does not face. Right. You know? So, yeah, uh, that's why there is the qualified immunity. Not every uh, citizen goes, you know, faces these life-threatening life situations. So... Um, but Do you see any national legislation that would make a difference, or is it really a state and municipal I think, issue in general, I think or police department? I think the mindset of uh, elected officials has to take place uh, right. in terms of saying we require that police be more approachable, be more of service, and uh, we will support you in doing that. 
And so, uh, so I think that happens with elected officials at all levels of government. And, uh, and yeah, I think we, we need to, when we hear that uh, defund the police, I'm not for defund the police. I support Black Lives Matter. Uh, but I think that uh, we have to uh, just really change the, the, the mindset of service. Well, I can't speak to folks holding their defund the police signs uh, in terms of their intention, but I think a lot of that is about channeling funding in different directions. It's not the total defunding of right. police departments. I don't think anyone's no. advocating that. No, and, and I'm not, and I don't think there right. is, but there's been that wide brush. That's right. Okay. And not all police officers are like the officer who had his knee on, the, on, the, um, on George Floyd. But that's the type of training that you see in Israel. Right. So, you know, do we want that here in the U.S., like the Israelis are treating the Palestinians? And in terms of the cultural change or both policy politics and cultural change that needs to take place. I saw a recent video that I think you've seen as well of police in Tampa. This is after the George Floyd murder with the neck on the police of a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest. Right. And uh, that did happen in Tampa last week where the officer had his knee on the person's on a woman's neck. Right. OK. And uh, and then the, the, the other people there are saying, hey, get off, get off her neck and uh, just continued on. So let's segue a little more fully to uh, Israel, Palestine. You talked about the mindset changes and the political changes that would need to take place to reform policing in the U.S. Uh, what do you think needs to change in U.S. policies? with respect to Israel that would eventually change the policing and the culture of policing as it affects Palestinians? Well, I think, uh, I think it, it requires good, faithful negotiation, equal ne negotiation. When we, the United States, are supportive of with our dollars with our tax dollars on the israelis and we say well oh, gee it's a two states uh, uh the, the two parties need to negotiate well we're not negotiating at an equal level here so there's an imbalance so i think we need to bring the balance and then have the negotiation so uh what i would like to see is one government there represented by both sides like we have here. So, so you're talking about uh, uh, a future single democratic state, which has yes. been floated as an option. Mm -hmm. um, in in uh, my experience, the uh, U.S. politicians will constantly parrot the idea of the two sides sitting together and negotiating a two-state no. solution. No. Now you shake your head. Why? Well, because it's unfair. Number one, one, one oppresses the other. So it, already you, it's unequal. So, so you, it, how do you it's balance unfair, that? But un how do you balance right. that so that you do have good negotiations? So I think one of the one things we need to do is withdraw from the process and let the two parties negotiate evenly. And that doesn't happen, nor do they want it to happen. So, how, you know, so... If you're oppressing people, why would you want to give up anything, you know? Now, from my reading of uh, the general media just in the last week, we've seen more of sort of normalizing of relations with Israel by, in this case, the United Arab Emirates. And the Palestinians seem to be, as ever, an afterthought. Uh, do you see any scenario where that's going to change over time? Well, uh, you know, there was the, uh, the United Arab Emirates, you know, with the agreement was to stop annexing the West Bank, for right. example. Well, it's already annexed. So, I mean, there are settlements developing every day there in, in, in the West Bank. 
where the Israelis are coming in, knocking down homes, uh, destroying the crops of uh, the Palestinians, and, and then establishing settlements there. So they're moving people away, and they just actually want them to go away from their own land. You know, how would we feel here in the United States if some, if, if the government came over, bulldozed our house, and said, you know, go on, because we're going to put uh, someone else in your house. And uh, even in the same house, they're, they're putting people in. So uh, it's, it's just totally wrong, and we're supporting that. And I find it strange that it's coming from uh, Jewish people. And believe me, I, I have many, many good friends who are Jewish, and, and, and many agree with me <laughs> uh, that, you know, what you've already gone through, and why, why do this now? Uh, you know, when I was police chief, uh, it was uh, the... Um, Holocaust Survivor Month, every, and I always brought in, when I was mayor, I should say, brought in uh, uh, survivors of the Holocaust to come and speak uh, at the library. So, uh, you know, the Holocaust uh, Museum in Augusta, I've been to the one in Washington. I, I, my, one of my best friends when I was a little kid, when it, my next door neighbor was Jewish. As a matter of fact, his older brother, became the magistrate judge here in Portland, David Cohen. And when I was U.S. Marshal, it was my job to protect him, my next door neighbor. <laughs> well, I, if I can editorialize briefly, my own perception is that the issue in Israel-Palestine is far less about Jewish versus Muslim, Israeli versus Palestinian, than it is the powerful versus the powerless. Exactly. And... Um, you referred previously to the corporate media rarely reporting the reality. Why do you think that is, and do you see any sign that that's changing over time? I would ask anyone watching, when have you ever seen the Palestinian side represented in any news out, uh, yeah, outlet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you don't. And so... Um, there is another side to the story, and I think people here have to, on their own, look into it as I did. And uh, when you do, you see what is really happening. You know, uh, Palestinians are being pro, uh, uh, referred to as terrorists, and even with the training. When uh, U.S. police go there, they refer to the Palestinians as terrorists. So that's the belief that comes back here. As a matter of fact, the uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel has said he likes it when U.S. police go there for training because they come back and they're pro-Zionists. Well, you know, uh, that just adds to the problem. So we need to get away from that. And we need uh, a, a media that is more fair that is more balanced, and we're not seeing that. Are you aware whether um, Israeli uh, security forces, police, army, have participated in training in Maine? No, was I'm not aware of it in Maine, but I am aware of it in the United but States. But I, I do believe that the head of Perhaps it was the police union did go to Israel and spoke highly. Uh, uh, it was the uh, former colonel of the Maine State Police. I see. Who had gone there and was impressed with the training. And, yeah, for certain things, okay. But I, I don't think the Israeli police were doing the service type of thing, like right. serving all of its people, okay, instead of just some people. Yep. Now, are you hopeful about the future of policing in the U.S. Um, in terms of the types of reforms that you've been talking about? Or do you think we are going to kind of retrench back to old ways once it's, it's this very, moment has passed? It's very difficult to break bad habits. And uh, I say that because uh, I was a chain smoker. 
at one time, and but I haven't I haven't smoked in 40 years, but it was very difficult. So, uh, but I think the more uh, attention is given to it, I think more pressure will bear on on the politicians to demand the changes. And so uh, we just can't have lip service to this. It really needs to be addressed uh, because we're getting away from it. And how we're getting away from it is the type of military type training that the police are receiving. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it's it's tough out there. I've been there. I've I've had my battles, you know, out on the street. Uh, you know, I've been knee down in, uh, in slush, you know, handcuffing someone. So I, I know what it is. But on the other hand, you can get uh, so much more with sugar, right? So I think uh, the human interaction between police and the people they serve has to happen. So it, that means coming together. That means getting out of your cruiser. That means getting out and talking to people, talking to kids. I had, um, I had allowed our officers to use uh, athletic type shoes uh, with their uniforms so, and have a basketball in the back of the cruiser and stop and shoot some baskets with the kids. You know, more of that has to happen. Yep. And, and, and have community meetings and, and sit there because problems in a neighborhood who knows the problems? It's the people. And who knows what, what will help solve it? The people. And, and so all they need is the police to help them in solving the problem. Now, we've only got a minute or less or two left. Yeah. Uh, to our viewers and the average citizen, what can they productively do, in your view, to have an impact on the direction of policing in the U.S.? And for that matter, the direction of uh, Israeli-Palestinian politics as it's influenced by the U.S. If I, I was sitting out in the audience, what the heck can I do? I'd say speak to your elected officials. Demand. You have a right to demand from them because they represent you. Demand from them these changes. I think I'm being signaled that we have one minute left. Okay. Um, well, um, I've got notes here, and we could certainly explore uh, all sorts of other areas. But I'll just end by saying I really appreciate your coming here. I appreciate your experience and sharing it with our viewers. I never thought I'd be sitting across from a former police chief because my experience has often been viewing them at a remove as the problem or the enemy. And it's good to really hear uh, your, your direct experience and, and the perspective that you bring to this. And it's a very hopeful one. And there are a lot of uh, police officers, very good police officers, caring police officers, That's you know. Right. We're done. Thank you very much, Larry. Good.